The next item of business is a statement by Jean Freeman on health and care update. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement, so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Jean Freeman. Ten minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This year, we are rightly celebrating 70 years of our National Health Service. Across this chamber, we have expressed our pride in our health and social care services and the remarkable commitment of our staff across the country. And while there is indeed much to celebrate, it is also our responsibility to look ahead to see what must be done to make sure that the whole system is equipped for the future. Over the coming weeks, I will set out what I believe to be important milestones in the journey we need to take. Today, I am publishing our understanding of the overall financial climate in which we will be working, our expectation of future demand, and the demand that places on future resourcing. Over the coming weeks, I will also provide an update on our NHS estate, setting the scene for a more detailed capital investment strategy I intend to bring to Parliament before the end of this financial year. And as I have set out to the Health Committee, I will, in the coming weeks, bring our plan to substantially and sustainably improve waiting times to this chamber. These important strategic developments underline our commitment to transparency and accountability and are supported by the regular reporting of the financial position for our NHS boards and integration authorities. All of these elements combined will provide the clarity necessary for the important discussion we need to have about the future shape of our NHS and social care services. The Scottish Government's health and social care delivery plan highlights the necessity of achieving long-term financial stability of our health and care system. The financial framework directly supports the delivery plan and sets out in more detail the potential approach and the types of initiatives required to deliver a financially balanced and sustainable health and social care system. It is important to view the health and social care system within the context of the overall Scottish Government budget, the greater fiscal responsibility for the Government and this Parliament, and the continued pressure of UK Government austerity. The financial framework is therefore firmly set within the context of the Scottish Government's first medium-term financial strategy published in May this year. Today's publication of the medium-term financial framework has required close and effective working with our partners across the whole sector, and I'm grateful in particular for the support from colleagues in NHS boards, integration authorities and COSLA who have supported this publication. I'm grateful too for the support of the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy who have welcomed the financial framework and encouraged other areas of the UK to consider the principles underpinning this work. <clears throat> the financial framework sets out the financial environment for the period to 2023-24. It follows the principles set out in the Scottish Government's medium-term financial strategy and reflects our current understanding of the UK Government's funding announcement in June for the NHS in England. Let me say at this point that the implications of the UK Government's announcement are still far from clear. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Economy and Fair Work sought immediate clarification on the true level of Barnet consequentials that would come to Scotland as a result of the plans in England. Derek Mackay sought confirmation that the claimed levels of consequentials would be a true net benefit to our budget. He also sought clarification on the implied income tax changes that had been suggested as a result of the UK Government's announcement. It is deeply disappointing that we still do not have the clarity sought from the UK Government on these issues. But the limited information that is available indicates that we will receive consequentials amounting to 3.3 billion between now and 2023-24. In finalising the financial framework, I have made the perhaps bold assumption that the UK government will honour its commitment, deliver the consequentials as a true net benefit and not reduce the Scottish government's funding by cuts applied elsewhere or by other measures. And I very much hope this is an area on which we can all be agreed. 
I can confirm that the Scottish Government remains committed to passing on health consequentials in full. This is reflected in this financial framework. Our commitments on health and care funding have already delivered over 13 billion in health funding this year, including over 550 million in investment in social care and integration. Other key investments we are committed to delivering include 500 million pounds for primary care by the end of this parliament and 250 million additional investment in mental health services over the coming years. But increased funding alone will not be sufficient to meet the challenges that lie ahead. Our health and social care services are faced with clear challenges, not least demographic change, price pressure, pressures on uh, areas such as medicines, rising demand and expectations. And we require to address all of this against a backdrop, backdrop of uncertainty caused by Brexit. The impact of Brexit on our existing and potential workforce and the estimated overall economic damage to Scotland's GDP of 12.7 billion by 2030. If we followed the status quo, running costs would increase by 5.9 billion in 2023-24 compared to 2016-17. To meet this challenge, a responsible government such as us, it is critical that our significant planned investment must be twinned with reform to drive further improvements in our services to achieve better outcomes for patients. These reforms include the development of regional working and better collaboration between the national health boards to improve services, including improved regional approaches to the planning and delivery of services. This will help drive change in how clinical networks are formed and help to reduce duplication in services and functions. I recognise the NH NHS boards being able to deliver the necessary reforms to achieve what has been outlined in the financial framework will take considerable effort. That's why today I am offering NHS boards a new deal. In return for their efforts to deliver the reforms for the future, I am facilitating a new three-year financial planning and performance framework for our NHS territorial boards. This change will require boards to deliver a break-even position over a three-year period, rather than annually, as is the case currently. In each year, boards will have a 1% flexibility on their annual resource budget to allow them scope to marginally under or overspend in that year. For this new deal to be successful, I believe it needs a new start. So to give all our territorial boards clear ground to move forward on that three-year planning cycle, I will not seek to recover NHS territorial boards' outstanding brokerage, the expenditure incurred by territorial boards over the last five years, which has been above their budget. I want all boards to be able to focus their attention on delivering the measures set out in the Health and Social Care Delivery Plan and this financial framework and to do that in a safe and appropriate way, making sure they maintain a strong focus on patient care and the delivery of services that are safe, effective, person-centred and timely. Presiding Officer, in publishing the financial framework, I want to inform the mature, responsible discussion about the future of our health and social care services that I have referred to before in this chamber. I have been clear on my expectations of the UK Government's funding announcement and how we intend to design, deliver and manage the right health and social care within our available resources. It is essential that we see the UK Government's commitment delivered in full. Failure to do so will have a direct detrimental consequence on the financial position outlined in the financial framework. I believe we can work together to take the steps required to equip our health and social care services with the resources and support required for the years and the generations ahead. And I commend this statement and this framework to Parliament. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in her statement. Uh, I would ask all those who wish to uh, raise questions to press the request to speak buttons. I'll allow you around 20 minutes, um, which should be adequate if everybody bears the limitations in mind. 
and I call Miles Briggs. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of her statement. The Cabinet Secretary, in the first statement to this Parliament as Health Secretary on the 12th of September, said she'd approach her job with mature reflection, and 22 days later, I'm sorry to say that this statement doesn't feel like that. HM Treasury figures show health spending in England has increased by 20% since 2011-16, but only by 14% in Scotland over the same time period. If this had increased at the same rate, NHS Scotland would have £676 million more to spend today. So can the Cabinet Secretary outline why SNP ministers have shortchanged our Scottish NHS at a time of record UK government health funding? And the Cabinet Secretary in her statement also mentions she intends to provide an update on the NHS estate. Communities across Scotland which have seen services cut and centralised will be concerned that this statement is the start of yet more SNP cuts and centralisation of our health services. So can I also ask the Cabinet Secretary, what are the parameters for this NHS estate review and will Parliament have a chance to see it before it's announced? Jean Freeman. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm grateful to uh, Mr Briggs for his questions. I have to start, though, by disagreeing with him. Health spending in Scotland is 7.1% higher than in the UK as a whole. So let's be clear about the facts here. And let's be clear that this government is not shortchanging anyone. And in terms of the estate, Mr Briggs, the only reason people would be concerned if it is if once more the Conservatives in this chamber put out false accusations and claims that are then rebutted by us but serve to do nothing more than add to concern and upset amongst the constituents you claim to represent. I am looking for a mature, reflective discussion and I really do hope that the Conservative benches show themselves able to rise to that challenge and get involved with us in planning our health service for the future. Anna Sarwar. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for early state of her statement and also for the way she has so far engaged this chamber as she settles into her new role. Uh, we welcome the financial framework and the extra time that helps to give boards to plan uh, their future services. Uh, from previous FOI responses, health boards have told us that they're expecting to make over £1 billion of savings over the course of this Parliament. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary set out how this medium-term financial framework impacts on those figures? and what levels of cuts will health boards will be expecting to make over the next three years. The Cabinet Secretary will also recognise the local government budget's impact on social care services. So can she also say again what this means for IGB budgets and any savings that they have to make? The statement also confirms that all brokerage over the last five years is to be written off. We have to recognise that the financial mismanagement that's happened in these boards has happened under this government. So can the Cabinet Secretary say how much this is going to cost and whether she has confidence in the financial management of health boards going forward. And finally, we welcome at last some honesty from the government on their plans for service reform. So can the Cabinet Secretary commit to setting out her plans to this chamber yeah. at a future date and also ensuring full public consultation? Yeah. Jean Freeman. Thank you very much. Um, I'm grateful to Mr Sarwar for his questions. Um, can I be clear, in terms of savings that boards are required to make, this is the case, and indeed always has been the case, that the money that boards save reta is retained by boards for allocation to other areas of spend. So these are not cuts. These are savings that we ask boards to make in order that they can use that resource in other areas of their spend. The money does not come back to me or to Scottish Government. It comes and stays with those boards for them to use to improve on the services that they have. In terms of IJB budgets, the financial uh, framework uh, clearly is for the service as a whole. And we have across, uh, in terms of the money from local government, but most importantly in terms of the money from this government and from health spend, contributed significantly to the IJBs and to the work that they are doing. Um, they have a degree of flexibility already because they are part of the local government accounting system. And what I am looking to do is provide the same degree of uh, three-year planning cycle, and I'm grateful to Mr Sarwar for welcoming that, as we already have with those IJBs. Mr Sarwar raises an important point about financial management. All of our boards are required to ensure and to report and to demonstrate, not just in the reporting that they do that is publicly available, but in the regular contact between my officials and their finance officers, that they are uh, prudently managing 
the budgets that they have and they are seeking value for money. There are pressures that come on boards as indeed on the health budget overall that we have little control over, inflation in terms of drug prices and so on. We have made positive decisions in terms of pay awards, which will be another pressure. But nonetheless, boards do have to financially manage their resources with some care. And where boards have in the past not shown themselves able to do that, or shown themselves needing some uh, additional skills or improvement, I want to assure Mr Sawa that my finance officials are actively engaged with them now, will continue to be engaged with them and report and monitor the work that's going on in those boards on a regular basis in order to ensure that all of our boards meet the standards of our best boards and the standards that we expect our boards to deliver in terms of using public funds to deliver quality health and social care. Call Ruth Maguire to be followed by Brian Whittle. Presiding officer, the financial framework is clearly predicated on the UK government actually delivering the Barnet consequentials that they boasted about earlier this year. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what the consequences for the framework will be if the UK government does not deliver on its promises in the budget later this month? Jean Freeman. Thank you very much. I'm grateful to Ms Maguire for that um, question. Um, in terms of answering her question, the financial framework as I said, assumes the full net benefit of those consequentials. In other words, there is no detrimental effect on the Scottish budget in other areas, including on any tax changes that the UK government may want to introduce. I'd uh, uh, advise members to look to what is almost the last page of the financial framework to see uh, what our anticipation is uh, of uh, uh, demand and expenditure in terms of health and social care, what we will do in terms of what we expect to achieve in, by way of reforms, and then imagine that if you take out £3.3 billion. And that is the impact of any uh, detriment in terms of those full consequentials uh, not coming to us in either full or in part. So it will destabilise that financial framework, and we would have to uh, look again at that. But it would be more than that it would be, in effect, a broken promise. And that is uh, significant in terms of how we work together with the UK government, as they tell us repeatedly they want us to do. Can I take this opportunity to, presiding officer, and my apologies, I did not pick up Mr Sawa's question in terms of uh, service reform. Um, there are two things I want to say on that. One is that our health and social care delivery plan uh, outlines what we need to do in service reform. I'm happy to speak to individual members or to party spokespeople about individual reforms board by board as they might come forward, but also on the wider reforms that we've already set out in terms of our primary care, GP working, our in uh, increase in the workforce and any other matters that may be of interest to members. Brian Whittle, followed by David Stewart. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I have to say, I was hoping for a, with a change of cabinet secretary, we might get a change of approach, but uh, it reminds me of the words of Roger Daltrey is meet the new boss, same as the old boss. But can I try and ask the cabinet secretary, given the reported struggles of, the, of your constituency health board, Ayrshire and Arm, to meet its financial uh, obligations, both its existing and future, how does she anticipate these new proposals will impact on the delivery of a number of procedures, including cancer treatment and cataract surgery, which are already areas of concern in our area? Jean Freeman. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're probably, well, we might not all be agreed, uh, but many of us agreed that wasn't actually Roger Daltrey uh, that said that. But that aside, um, this, this is the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport, and I'm sure, Mr Whittle, you and I will work very well in the weeks ahead. Uh, in terms of your question on waiting times, um, what, what we need to understand is what this is, is the setting out of the medium-term financial framework. Our understanding of the financial pressures set against the demands, set against what we know we need to do, assuming full net consequentials from the UK government, and therefore what the position looks like as we go forward. M members who have had the opportunity will see that even with those reforms, there is still a financial challenge there, and we need to work together to address that future financial challenge. We need to do some of that now, 
and that's the mature conversation that I live in hope for. In terms of waiting times, as Mr Whittle, I'm sure, heard me say, I will come to this Parliament with a plan for improved and sustainable improvement in our waiting times, including those times that he mentioned, and the resourcing that I will then outline, I commit to that, is indeed taken account of in this framework. David Stewart, followed by Alison Johnson. <clears throat> uh, thank you, President Officer. And whilst I welcome many of the initiatives uh, in the statement, such as waiving brokerage, could I ask the Cabinet Secretary about the key underlying trends that have caused financial instability in many boards, such as NHS um, Highland? Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will know that the Auditor General made clear that brokerage for Highland is likely to be needed over the next three years. And areas of financial concern are well known to the Cabinet Secretary. They're adult social care, they're the drug overspend, and they're the cost of hiring medical locums. What comfort can the Cabinet Secretary give to patients and staff in Highland that the next three years won't just be more of the same, or is she saying, as Bob Dylan said, that the times they are changing? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Okay, so I'm not going to get into a competition, right, um, quoting uh, songs, although I'm, I'm pleased that members, both members, uh, have actually gone for songs in my era. Um, that's a comfort to me. Uh, Mr. Stewart makes an important point, and it, it partly links, I believe, to what Mr. Sarwa was asking me, which is about, um, it's, it's fine, and I, I I appreciate the fact that they welcome that we are in effect clearing the slate, introducing that uh, three-year planning cycle, giving that degree of flexibility year on year within those three years. But the end position for each of uh, our territorial boards at the end of three years is that they have to break even. Um, so we cannot continue with a situation where uh, boards uh, have significant overspends on their budgets, but albeit that those spends have been on patient care. So in looking at how we deploy our resources to boards and how we expect them to deploy their resources, part of the reforms are looking at how we can ensure that the resources we have within all the caveats that I outlined are adequately targeted towards patient care, meeting those waiting times and so on with some of the additional resource that we will come forward with. And that we also value our workforce, we increase our recruitment and we meet those pay pressures that I talked about. Now, I am convinced that where we have boards that are managing to do that now, not every board is looking for brokerage, and indeed in some uh, where they uh, set out at the beginning of this year looking for that, that, that figure is coming down, and if we look at previous years, we see that that is what happens. We have uh, a small number of boards where brokerage is, is definitely expected, as they would describe it at the end of this year, and that is what I'm saying. I will not seek uh, repayment of that, if you like. But in those other boards where financial management and quality of, of uh, patient care is being finely balanced but is being managed, then I want those other boards and the lessons that they give to their colleagues to be transferred over and my officials to help them to do that. And that is what is actively happening right now. Now, in some boards like Highland, I completely accept there are additional pressures in terms of the geography and the demands that are there. But some of the initiatives we've introduced in terms of rural working and GP uh, recruitment in rural areas and so on, will, I am sure, help to address some of those new or different challenges between our, health, our territorial boards. Alison Johnson, followed by Alex Cole-Hamilton. Um, thank you. I welcome the move to a three-year financial planning cycle and the fact that the government isn't seeking to recover outstanding brokerage. Um, the ability of NHS boards to forecast demand and to plan effectively to meet it and to deploy the resources most effectively hinges on them having access to the best data, to the highest quality information. And I'd like to understand what, can the Cabinet Secretary tell us what the Scottish Government is doing to offer board support in that regard? Jean Freeman. Thank you very much and I'm grateful to uh, Ms Johnson for what is... I believe an important question. She's absolutely right that part of the key to this is being able to forecast demand. Um, one of the areas where we have some of the highest quality information that is um, drilled down to uh, quite a significant level is from our integration uh, authorities and our integration joint boards. What we have not been doing uh, to the degree that I require us to do that is triangulating all the information and the data we have so that we can adequately forecast demand 
uh, from one area to another. And we are now beginning work on that to ensure that the data that comes into us, the data those integration authorities uh, currently hold, is um, not only shared as widely as, as appropriate and uh, as it should be, but is also triangulated so that we get more than a one-dimensional picture, if you like, about what demand looks like coming uh, towards us for our health and social care services in the decades ahead. Alex Cole Hamilton, followed by Alistair Allen. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of her statement. Three years ago, the Scottish Government said it would eradicate dis uh, delayed discharge. It is one of the biggest financial drains on the resources of our health service, and this week, delayed discharge got worse. Will the proposals outlined in this statement end delayed discharge? Jean Freeman. This is the financial framework. This is our current estimate of the financial position that our health service faces in the years ahead and of the demand that is placed on that health service. It is not a framework that has specific initiatives within it, nor should it have. The uh, waiting times plan that I will bring forward, which is looking at um, improved and sustainability in our waiting times work, which links to uh, delayed discharge, as Mr Cole Hamilton well knows, uh, will come forward to this Parliament in the coming weeks. And it is there that we will look to see how much further we can make an improvement in delayed discharge. But I would draw his attention to the successful work of the uh, Aberdeen uh, Integration Authority, who successfully, by some uh, significant percentage points, not only brought down delayed discharge, but also brought down uh, unscheduled bed days, if you like, in hospital. And it's learning from those areas that I intend we will scale up and transfer across all our integration authorities when I talk about increasing the pace uh, and the effectiveness of their work. Uh, can I say at this point, I don't think I'm going to be able to get everyone in. Alistair Allen, followed by Annie Wells. The Health Secretary made the welcome announcement of a new deal for health boards to give them greater flexibility between annual budgets. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what flexibility integration authorities have to plan beyond annual budgets? Jane Freeman. Uh, I'm grateful to Mr Allen for that question. Integration authorities are in accounting terms part of local government and so they have that degree of flexibility and they also have the capacity to hold reserves. So what I am trying to do is ensure that that degree of flexibility and uh, capacity to plan within a reasonable time frame is also something that our NHS boards can benefit from. Annie Wells, followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary has stated that the brokerage to those health boards that have it will be written off. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary when this will be and will we see it in this year's Scottish Government budget? and also an estimate of how much debt will be written off. Jean Freeman. Um, thank you. I'll start with the last part of that question first. Our current estimate of what brokerage would be for the last five years, so it's not about this current year alone, is around £150 million. Um, all territorial boards will start with a clean slate from 2019-20. Um, and that's when we will begin that three-year planning cycle with all of, uh, all of that work that I described earlier. In the meantime, boards will continue to work to reduce what they anticipate will be uh, their level of brokerage. And uh, in many of our boards, we're seeing that coming down significantly as they finalise and refine their plans in terms of reform and service delivery. But everyone will start, as I said, with that new deal from the financial year 1920. John Mason, followed by Jenny Mara, who will be the last question. Uh, thank you. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned Brexit in her statement, and uh, presumably that could have an impact both on the economy and less taxes, which would put a pressure on the NHS, as well as a potential shortage of staff, both skilled and unskilled. Does she think the UK Government understands these extra pressures on our NHS? Jane Freeman. Well, I, thank you. I'm grateful to Mr Mason for his question. Um, I don't have a, a insight into the minds of UK government ministers, but by their actions it appears to me that they do not understand 
or if they do, they are not taking sufficiently seriously the impact of Brexit on our health service, not just in Scotland, but the health service in England and in Wales and indeed in Northern Ireland. All of us benefit significantly from uh, EU nationals being uh, valued, skilled, experienced members of our workforce. We also all benefit from our uh, own workforce being able to work in EU countries. We benefit from the mutual recognition of qualifications. We benefit from being part of, and in, and in Scotland's case, leading members of international research collaboratives, which themselves produce a significant input to our economy. So there is a great deal here that is at risk and that is troublesome and worrying. And I hope that the more we repeat it, and I look to colleagues across this chamber to assist us in this, not least those colleagues on my left-hand side, that we begin to get the clarity we need from the UK government and they begin to demonstrate that if they do understand this, then they are going to act to do something about it. Jenny Mara. Can I welcome and congratulate the Cabinet Secretary on the financial framework today? It's been recommended for some time now. It's been long awaited. And I do feel that the Conservative front bench have really misjudged the advance that has been made today because it allows us to make the shift to the care that we need. A point of clarification, if I may, presiding officer. The Cabinet Secretary said she will uh, write off all outstanding brokerage. Now, she knows that NHS Tayside has a projected deficit of £18.7 million for this financial year. Will she write that off as well so that we can really start with a clean, a clean sheet to make that shift of care that we need? Thank you. <laughs> Jean Freeman. I'm, great, I'm grateful to Ms Mara for that question and uh, for her recognition, as I believe actually colleagues uh, on the Labour benches have done uh, of the importance of this financial framework and what it actually is as opposed to what it's not. Um, that's an important question that she asked and, and by my answer earlier that all health boards will start with a clean slate from the financial year 19, uh, 2019 to 2020 then I believe I'm answering and saying yes uh, that will be the case. There will be no brokerage look to be recovered where that, that additional spend has been on patient care uh, from the end of this year, we move forward uh, from 1920 to that three-year cycle and that clean slate. That concludes questioning on the Cabinet Secretary's statement. Uh, my apologies to Rona Mackay, who wished to ask a question. Can I say to members that we have eaten into time for the next debate, but we still didn't manage to get through all the questions. We have a couple of moments for folk to get organised. <laughs> 